In this lesson, we'll finish up our discussion of the urinary system by taking a look at urinary physiology. We'll do a brief overview of the three phases or three steps to urine formation. Then we'll take a look at the normal constituents of urine as well as the abnormal constituents, things that we don't want in the urine. A term that you should know, the process of urination is known as micturition. Now, when we form urine, there's three distinct phases if you want to highlight. The first one is going to be called filtration. Then we're going to do reabsorption and then secretion. All right, so let's read this first and then I'll show you a picture to, get, to kind of explain it a little bit better. The hydrostatic pressure that's going to be inside the glomerular capillaries is going to force solutes out of the blood into the capsular space, even plasma. And we produce this fluid known as filtrate. Just an interesting uh, statistic. We make about 48 gallons of filtrate per day. So we don't go to the bathroom that much, right? We don't pee out 48 gallons of urine per day. That's because of the second step of urine formation we reabsorb about 99% of the water and most of the useful solutes, you know, things like glucose, amino acids, you know, things that um, we, we need to keep back into the blood. All right, so that's um, known as reabsorption. And then finally, the last stage of urine formation, we can now add other things like excess ions, a lot of times hydrogen ions potassium ions. They can be added to the urine, drugs, waste products. They can be added um, as a final step and that is known as secretion. Okay, so filtration, reabsorption, secretion. And now that we have a little bit of an overview, this is actually showing us how the hydrostatic pressure can uh, will force the fluid and solutes that are in the glomerulus. So this over here, guys, where my pointer is, this is showing a glomerular capillary. How do I know that? You can see it has little pores in it. And if you remember from a previous lesson, um, we said that these capillaries were fenestrated, right? which means they have little openings in it. So just to kind of give you an idea, the net pressure is always going to be higher inside the capillary and it's going to push the fluids and the solutes out. There's a greater pressure or an ultimate uh, concentration or a pressure gradient of 10 millimeters of mercury. This red arrow represents the actual measurement of 50 millimeters of mercury. It's that much higher here than here. But we have some opposing forces. This blue line represents osmotic pressure. Um, proteins in the blood such as albumin, let's say here, um, actually pull water back in. Osmotic pressure is a, pu a pulling force where a hydrostatic pressure is a pushing force. So even though we have a pushing force force out of 50 millimeters of mercury, there's a pulling force of 25 going in. So that cuts this in half. In addition, there's also water pressure out here of 15 millimeters of mercury. That's a force going in. So if you um, kind of add this all up, 50 minus 25 minus 15 gives us a net force of going out of 10. Right, so it's always going to be going this way. We're not going to have filtrate going back into the blood. So this whole process is known as filtration. Again, notice all of this takes place in the glomerular capsule. Right? This is the, uh, the, the capsular lining right here, the capsular epithelium. Right? And then again, here's going to be your capillary. So here's a picture showing you the glomerulus. And again, this green arrow represents the formation of the filtrate into this space here. Once the filtrate is made, it goes into the proximal convoluted tubule. So here, notice the arrows point out. You're going to be reabsorbing um, water. I almost said like 99% of water, ions, organic nutrients, things like um, glucose, amino acids, things that we don't want to get rid of in the urine. Right? And then from here, we're going to go through the uh, nephron loop. 
and again again we're gonna get more reabsorption of water more reabsorption of things that we want to keep in the bloodstream things that we don't want to go into the urine and then over here reabsorption is probably done at this point for the most part this would be secretion see this arrow here we're adding something into the distal convoluted tubule so like I said maybe hydrogen ions maybe um, potassium ions things like that different types of uh, drugs or toxins that's going to be called secretion All right just here's another blow up of that again filtrate formation the reabsorption um, of water and ions and nutrients that we want are going to go from the tube back into the bloodstream. That's what those arrows are pointing to. They're going back into the bloodstream. Here too, water going back into the bloodstream. Um, more ions and nutrients, anything that we want to keep back into the bloodstream. Only here would be secretion. That's the third step. So filtration. All these arrows here are pointing to reabsorption and then here's a secretion here's a little bit of secretion too where we could add something into the um, proximal convoluted tubule this you'll cover in much more detail in your lecture this is just kind of an overview at this point here we have urine and now the urine goes into the collecting duct and we can do more secretion and reabsorption here depending if we need or need to get rid of something and then we finally have urine down over here so this is an example of a, a urine uh, sample cup right, where people can urinate in there and then we can we could test it. So let's take a look at the characteristics of normal urine. Um, the volume of urine that we make per day uh, is about one to two liters. Obviously it's going to vary considerably based on your activities, how much you're drinking, that type of thing. But typically urine is yellow or amber in color. Uh, if you're dehydrated and your urine is more concentrated, we know that the urine is going to be darker. right? But if you're drinking a lot of water all day, um, the urine is going to be more water-like. water, water -like. Um, as you see different patients, as you uh, come into contact with different people, you'll see that diet, medications, and even diseases can affect the color of uh, urine. Things that are traumatic, like kidney stones, sometimes they're sharp or they're gravelly. They can cause bleeding, and that can put blood into the urine even. Now, normally, when you look at urine in one of these cups, and you were to hold it up to the light, if it was, if it was a clear cup, the you would be able to look through the urine it would be clear but if you let urine stand it will get cloudy upon standing that's normal uh, the odor is slightly aromatic but if you leave urine out for a long period of time it starts to take on the odor of ammonia now, so it will change in uh, odor over time if you were to test the pH, there's a normal range from 4.6, which is acidic, to 8, which is alkaline. But the average uh, pH, if we were to check it you know, on average, is about 6. So it's going to be slightly acidic. Remember that 7 is neutral. Right? So it's usually um, acidic because this is one of the ways that we get rid of excess hydrogen ions from our body. Okay, so one to two liters per day, normal color is yellow or amber. This can change based on concentration, diet, medications, trauma. It should normally turn uh, cloudy if urine just stands, and it will also change in odor as it becomes, uh, as it stands longer, it will become ammonia like. And again, the average pH is about six. So one of the things we can measure is something known as the specific gravity. And basically, this tells us how much solutes are in the urine. So this is the solute concentration of urine. The instrument that we use is known as a urinometer. Right? So this is something that you can do in the lab, and you can measure how concentrated the urine is. Um, as an example, it kind of compares or it will compare distilled water, which is pure water with no solutes in it, theoretically. That has a specific gravity of 1, so we kind of use that as the reference range. Then urine obviously does have solutes 
dissolved in it and that means it's going to be higher than one normally so um, it ranges from 1.003 this would be a dilute urine to 1.030 that would be a more concentrated urine right if you were dehydrated uh, you're probably going to be more on this end over here okay this is what we call the specific gravity So let's take a look at some of the things we don't want to see in the urine. That would include albumin. Um, if you remember from the blood lab, this is a normal blood protein. Um, it should stay in the um, it should stay in the blood. Maybe small amounts would be normal but really it shouldn't have any albumin. Usually we see it when there's disease, chemical toxicity that does damage to the nephron or even injury. Um, glucose is sugar. Right, this we see with diabetes. So when people have really high levels of sugar, they dump out extra glucose into the urine. Red blood cells we don't want to see. That indicates trauma tumors, <laughs> kidney disease, and again, as we said before, maybe even kidney stones. Uh, white blood cells we don't want to see in urine either. That's going to tell us we have infection. Okay, so this would be red blood cells, and then if you remember, different um, uh, white blood cells. Some other abnormal constituents, ketones. Uh, these are chemical byproducts of lipid metabolism. Right? When people uh, lose a lot of weight rapidly, they produce these ketones in their blood, and we spill that out into the, into the urine. So we see this with diabetes, especially type 1 diabetics, uh, people that are anorexic, right? They're not eating, so they're going to break down a lot of fat starvation, you're breaking down fat, um, uh, low carbohydrate diets, you may have heard of keto diets, right? This is where you're trying to burn more fat and as a result you produce ketones because you're not burning carbs, you're burning fat. Uh, bilirubin is a byproduct of red blood cell production. The same thing with urobilinogen. Both of these would be examples of conditions where we're breaking down red blood cells there's something known as hemolytic anemia, right? We're breaking down red blood cells. Uh, we could see it with hepatitis, cirrhosis, uh, obstruction of the different bile ducts, right? That would cause these two to be um, elevated. Sometimes uh, we can have masses that have hardened and assume the shape of the kidney tubes. We call them casts. They can be white blood cells, red blood cells, epithelial cells, or even other uh, uh, minerals and things like that um, that take on the shape of the, uh, of the tube. And then um, microbes would also be abnormal. Normally urine is basically sterile, right? Should not have any microbes in it. So uh, it would be an in, uh, indication that somebody does have a UTI, right? A urinary tract infection. One of the most common um, UTIs is from E. coli. That's a common bacterial infection. The reason for that is E. coli is a something that we see normal in fecal matter. So it's very easy from fecal matter to contaminate the urinary tract. Uh, a common fungal infection is Candida, right? Candida albicans. And so people sometimes get a urinary tract infection that is Candida. So here's some pictures of some casts. These are different uh, things that have taken on the shape of the kidney tubule. So just as some examples, uh, white blood cells, right, pus, red blood cells, epithelial cells, different types of gra grains that we have, hyaline. It's just different chemicals. Uh, you, you don't have to memorize these. It's just kind of interesting. Uh, different crystals, uh, ammonium, magnesium, phosphate crystals, uric acid crystals, uh, crystals calcium carbonate, calcium oxalate, even cholesterol, calcium phosphate, these are all different uh, abnormal constituents of our uh, urine. Right? And then again, we don't want any um, type of microbes at all. So here they're showing you some bacteria. This would be some like uh, bacillus bacteria. They're rod-like yeast. Uh, you may have heard of trichomonas. It's like a parasite. Okay, so that concludes this lesson on uh, urinary physiology, including normal and some abnormal constituents of urine.